It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Joseph Field all the way from San Francisco, California. He's the ideal dental practitioner for anyone who is afraid of the dentist, nervous about dental implant surgery, and adamant about receiving the very best in dental care. He specializes in dental implants and aesthetic restoration, but he's much more than an implant expert. He's distinguished for his gentle and caring chairside manner, his expertise in general and implant dentistry, and his use of advanced dental technology to guarantee the best clinical results. Dr. Field is committed to providing a stress-free dental implant placement experience for his patients. Widely recognized for his attentive and personal chairside manner, Dr. Field is not only adept at putting patients at ease and helping them feel comfortable, but he also offers a variety of additional relaxation options from aromatherapy and paraffin treatment to IV sedation to guarantee his patients a calm and relaxing experience. Dr. Field has achieved a nearly unmatched level of skill in dentistry, with his diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology, signifying the highest level of competence in implant dentistry. He's also one of the few implant specialists to offer zirconi implants for metal allergies. In addition, Dr. Field is an Invisalign elite provider, one of a very small number of general dentists who achieve this top designation of Invisalign proficiency and a certified IV sedation specialist. Due to his ability to combine orthodontic cases with implant dentistry, Dr. Field is able to restore patient smiles, even in the most extreme cases, with a combination of cutting-edge dental te- implant technology like iTero, digital scanning for perfectly fitting restorations, and CERAC for same-day dental care, plus state-of-the-art aesthetic techniques. Dr. Field helps his patients achieve a natural, healthy, and permanent smile. For patients missing some or all of their teeth, Dr. Field can provide single, multiple, or full mouth dental implants to help patients restore their smile for good. Dr. Field credits his success to his education, both past and present. He completed his BS Physiology at Brigham Young University and then went on to pursue his doctor dental surgery at the University of Southern California School of Dentistry. His passion for continuing education has driven him to pursue several other designations which have expanded his expertise, allowing him to provide the best quality patient care and clinical outcomes. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. After completing the Maxi course, only an elite class of dentists hold this distinction, making them the top in the industry. He's a fellow of the Academy of General Dentistry, fellow of the International Congress of Implantology, diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology, um, a loss. Altos native, Dr. Phil takes pride in getting to know his patients, understanding their needs, and giving back to the community. When he's not providing his patients with the best, most modern dental implant and Invisalign treatment, Dr. Phil makes time to host free dental implant seminars to the local community or joins up with the entire Peninsula Center of Cosmetic Dentistry team to offer free dental care to Bay Area veterans. While he's not working, Dr. Phil enjoys contributing to dental journals and pursuing his interest in photography and website design. Outside the office, you're most likely to find him golfing, playing basketball, hiking, or camping, attending sport events with his family, and we both have four children. My, I've already done all my work. My boys are 22, 24, 26, 28, but your work's just starting. Yours are 10, 8, and two three-year-old twins, so you're a very busy man. So how are, how are the three-year-old twins doing? They're good. They're uh, very active. Are, are they both? Are they identical? or Fraternal, but both girls. So fraternal, which means they're not identical. Correct. But they're both girls. So are they best friends? Um, yeah, they're pretty good friends, actually. They do well together. <laughs> better, better than my boys. I'll put it that way. I went all the way through school with these two twins, and it was the most amazing thing because they um, they were identical twins and had extremely opposite personalities. One <laughs> was outgoing and the life of the party, and the other one was so painfully shy, uh, she never said a word. And I always thought that was so bizarre. The two identical twins could stand out like that. So, um, but you know, the one I called you, you didn't call me. Um, you're a legend in the field. I never thought about implants and metallurgy when they started coming out with those uh, porcelain and ceramic implants. I always thought that was an aesthetic deal. I, I until I um, was reading about you, I didn't realize that there could be a um, metal allergy component to this. Yeah, uh, neither did I until it actually kind of presented in my office with a patient of mine. And that's what got me down the path of finding options for patients that have true allergies to these metal implants. Wow. So, um, so I, you know, you always think that um, titanium and gutta percha and gold and silver are inert. 
but you think some people truly have a uh, an allergy to titanium or some of the little um, other metals that might be found in there? Yeah, I've had patients have biologic reactions to this material and really only alleviated once the, the implant has been removed from their body. Um, they're the minority, but they're out there. Wow. And, and, you know, and it seems like, um, you know, it was Gordon Christian who told me that this was a uh, far bigger European problem than Asian, African, Latino. He was telling me that, um, that the one thing he noticed is that um, gold, silver doesn't react with carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen at room temperature. And, um, but if you ever wear a base metal, um, European people, their skin is more acidic and it'll leach the base metal and they'll get a green tattooing around their finger. Right. If you put a non-precious metal crown on, especially like Irish, English, Scottish, Scandinavian, they'll get that metal tattooing around the gum line. But he says he just has never seen that in dark skin, Asians, Africans, Latinos, and he thought there was something with the pH of the skin. So I imagine um, that was leaching more metal out. Um, so he said, uh, you know, he, he showed all kinds of cases where someone put a porcelain to non-precious metal and tattooed the hell out of someone's uh, gum tissue around it. So uh, right. I'm, I, it probably might be a, more of a problem with um, Northern Europeans. Yeah, I think you're right. I've seen on one patient with uh, Indian descent, but that was the only one that was non-Caucasian that I've seen. So just one. So all the rest were Caucasian, but one. But one. Uh, in descent. Yeah. Interesting. And maybe he um, had generations go. Maybe that uh, India was a British empire. Maybe he has some. Yeah, it, there could be some British uh, blood there for sure. Yeah, very interesting. So when you said aromatherapy and paraffin, I have to I have to admit I cracked up because I'm from Kansas and I thought that's something you'd only find in the Bay Area of California. I don't think anybody would ever walk in Kansas or Arizona and ask for a paraffin, but you're out there in uh in California. Is that a California thing? Or did you also see that when you were going when you were going to BYU in Utah? No, it's probably <laughs> it's probably here. But I'm, again, you know, I'm from here, so I hate the smell of a dental office. I always did growing up, and so the the rationale is, hey, let's not make it smell like a dental office. Let's make it smell good. And you know, some aromas actually help calm people, relax them, and certainly in a dental environment, that's advantageous. Well, you know, uh, people joke at aromatherapy, but when you read the um, stuff by uh, Kroger, the number one distributor in the in America, number one is. Uh, uh, Walmart, number two, is Kroger, which owns like uh, Dillon's in Kansas and Fry, all these grocery store chains. And then three is Costco, then four is Amazon. Uh, Costco and Kroger will tell you that the reason they have a bakery in their grocery stores is because when women walk into a grocery store and they smell a bakery, they spend more money per basket. And they have figured, they have scientifically figured out that when they increase the cart size 50%, the, the total volume of uh, sales uh, will follow. And yeah. if they and the bakery, a lot of these bakeries don't make any money, but they can't take out the bakery because when mom goes in there and she smells cooking food. So I would think aromatherapy would have to be, um, should be studied extensively in dentistry because you're right. I even walk into my own dental office and in the winter when it's really nice out, I'll oftentimes uh, leave the door wide open and I'll tell my team, we got to air this place out. It smells like a chemical farm. But when right. it's 118 degrees outside <laughs> and you got the air conditioners on high, you can't do it. And you get bottled up there in the summer and the place stinks. I, I, so you think, uh, what kind of smells do you think relax people? Eucalyptus is a good one. L lavender is a good one. Uh, those are probably our two that we go to the most. Citrus is a good one. Uh, so those are the ones that we use most commonly. And, you know, we had a lady on here just a few days ago from your neck of the woods who does dental office design. And she was saying, how, showing all this research on uh, how color, like uh, light blues, relax people, whereas yeah. like reds and orange, oranges make people aggravated. And, and right. uh, some of these uh, uh, airport restaurants like orange and yellow because they want you to grab your food and then leave and make room for someone else. So right. I think uh, the cup, the proper uh, look and the proper smell would go a long way in a dental office where half the world is afraid of us. Right. Yeah, no one likes to go. And so, I mean, I look at it, I try to be as objective as I can as a patient. Uh, I, I hate being a patient. So <laughs> anything that makes me feel better, I think, is, a, is worthwhile. Huh. Now, did California vote in medical marijuana on this last? They did. 
Yep. They did Arizona. Uh, I think Arizona is the only state that turned it down. But you know, I'm uh, I'm I still can't believe there's not some dentist who's made the news of also <laughs> adding. Obviously, you're not going to smoke <clears throat> marijuana right. dental, but they have those edibles they talk about in, in um, right. Colorado. I'm surprised no one's added uh, on their marketing. Come in and eat an uh, uh, um, a dentist brownie or a dental <laughs> cookie. And uh, and I'll take the edge off. Do you think that's around the corner, or do you think that's getting? Because you do sedation too, right? Do you, you, know, think, do you that... see? Do you see an, an edible marijuana as a form of an oral, uh, an oral, relaxing, like taking a volume or something? Well, I have patients that admit to me that that's what they do, um, and it helps them. So, you know, I don't know if I'd ever get to the point where I'm going to prescribe that or recommend that to people, but. Um, certainly patients here in our area are pretty educated on the benefits of marijuana. And so it's, 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 it's used, it's used by my patient population. Well, I'll tell you how old I am. When we were in dental school in Kansas city from 83 to 87, there was a dentist there and he went by Dr. Ace and that was not his name, but he was uh, friends of uh, mine and uh, me and Randy Kerwin went over and visit him. He's a dentist in Kansas and he had a full wet bar in his waiting room. And he had, he swore that at least 10% of all of his patients uh, chose him because they would get there early and make themselves, you know, he, he said you could make any drink at his bars. You could make a white Russian, anything. And mm-hmm. uh, he had a full bar and he thought that was an amazing practice builder. But now mm-hmm. fast forward 30 years later, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if that would be a very good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it for legal purposes. I mean, I wouldn't even let them have alcohol at a staff party. And I've gotten mad at the staff over the years because sometimes they'll bring it in. I'll say, man, if someone leaves a staff party and oh, goes and T bones in, in an in a intersection, yeah, we, you're we're, we're, we're going to lose everything. We just right. can't do it. Yep. And then they say, ah, you're being a stick in the mud. And I'm like, America has 1 million attorneys. And I guarantee you, I'm not going to be the guy buying the liquor. At the, right. the team party, that's just pure stupidity. Well, half of them are in California, so I, I feel you on that one. <laughs> half of who's in California? The oh, attorneys. The lawyers? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, so I'm, this is Dentistry Uncensored. I don't want to talk about anything that anyone agrees with. Um, Joseph, you know, you like going by Joseph or Joe, or what do you like to go oh, by? Joe. Joe's great. Joe. Joe. Joe, the, these kids, I mean, you're in San Francisco Bay. You got two dental schools there. You got University of Pacific, which is private. You got right. University of California, San Francisco. But anyway, I'm in here in Arizona where uh, they have two dental schools, both private. These kids are coming out with a ton of debt, and you're in love with digital dentistry. So I want you to talk slowly and walk through the math on this because a lot of these kids are coming out of school and say, well, I want to be a great dentist like Joe someday. I want to get into implants. I want to do all these things. But gosh, CAD CAM, that's a buck fifty. Digital impressions, that's at least 30. CBCTs, that's at least 100, 120. What, right. Walk through, I mean, I mean, a kid can literally double their student loan debt by buying three things. They could buy a Lenap, there's 100. Uh, right. CBCT, there's 100. CAD CAM, 150. Boom. Three, three good decisions, and now I double my student loan debt. So do you just yeah. have to marry good money? I mean, I tell these kids when they get out of school, they should find an 80-year-old lady who's worth millions and, st- and start dating and marrying her, you know, first. And, uh, and then when she passes away, then you'll be debt-free. You'll have all your student loans paid off. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's a huge deal. It's a big problem because, like, they're coming out, let's see, average 250000 350. I mean, it's just, it's not feasible. My, my recommendation, I've, you know, a lot of friends of, you know, their children are in school, dental schools, et cetera. My recommendation coming out of school is find a practice to link up with, get your feet wet, start getting the experience, let them pay the bills on those big ticket items, get exposure using them. And then when the time comes, you've paid some uh, debt down, you know, look at maybe buying a practice at that point. I just don't think in today's economy, this kind of debt load, students coming out of school are really in a position to buy a practice out of school or really within the next, the first three years. And well, it, it's really, um, you know, the Federal Reserve owns the uh, most uh, PhD economists on earth. I think they have almost 4,000 PhD economists working for them. And they said this $1 trillion of student loan debt is now affecting the housing market. 
because that's right. the biggest sector of the economy. And so many millennials can't qualify for a house because they're, they're, they're muscling these student loans. And it's uh, so sad because you never hear a conversation from the education community about how they can educate people for less money. They're right. always expanding, hiring, building. I mean, they're still raising tuitions every year. Yeah. So, yeah, right. it, it's the, these poor dental schools. It, it, it's different. Right. No, and, and that's and that's where, like, the corporate dental model comes in and, you know, love it or hate it. It's it's filling a void of, of where are these guys going to go? You know, where are these dentists going to go when they graduate school? And these corporate dental models that have been around since I was in dental school, it's it's a great attractant to, to young dentists, you know? Yeah, and these dentists that, uh, that hate it. Uh, well, they're they're not providing jobs for our colleagues. I mean, six thousand kids come out of school and they close their office Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so their own patients in Salina, Kansas, are calling with a toothache, getting an answering machine uh, when they could have hired an associate from UMKC and had him right. work Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. They're, they're not providing jobs. Then they get mad at corporate who is providing jobs. But but let's say but uh, take the money away. Why do you like? What do you like about digital dentistry? I mean, what 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 turned what what are you passionate about that's digital? Well, I mean, again, maybe I see things differently growing up here in Silicon Valley, right? We're kind of the epicenter for the technology revolution. But uh, for me to be able to provide a digital workflow for a patient, where hey, I don't have to use that goopy stuff, which no one likes the, the impression material. I mean, let's be honest. I can do a digital workup of an implant case, for example. Uh, scan the mouth, do a CBCT scan, plan the case out, get a guide printed, a 3D printed guide, do the surgery, have a crown made ahead of time, install it, all done in very seamless fashion. I mean, it, it's it's pretty amazing to see, think where we've come in even the last 10 years with this digital workflow. It's 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 just fun, Howard. I mean, it's just darn fun. I, I want you I want you to address the most controversial part of it because you're out there in Silicon Valley, which I assume is Silicon Valley basically San Jose. Uh, from San Jose to South San Francisco, essentially. Did you ever uh, help Dion Warwick find the way to San Jose? <laughs> I, I did not. Sorry. That was one of my favorite songs growing up, <laughs> Dion Warwick, and her sister was. Uh, it was her niece who was. Uh, um, who Dion Warwick. No, no. Uh, um, who who was the uh, who was Dion Warwick's uh, niece? Um, the, the the biggest famous Whitney Houston. Oh, okay. Yeah, her co- her it was her niece who was uh, Whitney Houston, but her cousin, cousin niece, whatever. Um, so the uh, um, so you have something like Apple, which is a closed system, and you have the uh, Serona Densely Serona, where the uh, the CAD CAM. Cirac machine and the Galileo, so pretty close. It, you know, it's a very close system. To me, it seems like the advantage is it's just easier to implement. And then you have open systems, which are more like Google. Um, but um, it seems like you got it works pretty good if you're really techy, and yeah. you know you might want to have hook up all these different mixing scanners and CAD cams and all that stuff. But I've been into a little a lot of dental offices where they have a very tight closed system like. Densefly, Serona's uh, uh, CAD CAM, uh, Galileo's, and it seems like all the dental systems know how to use it. They all, they all know how it works. And then right. you go into other offices that mix and match all the printers, and it's open format great. But, man, if you're not born in Silicon Valley and you don't love the ins and outs of technology, I, I tell people, if you're one of those guys that you got to have an IT guy come and reboot your computer or, or help you figuring out these things, I don't really know. I think you should be an open uh, format system. So, what, what's your view on the closed no, think, versus open? Yeah, and well, I'll tell you. So, I have I have two Cerex, two Omnicams. I have two Iteros. I have a um, the Trio scanner. I have a Plan Mecca comb beam. So, I mean, I, I have all of these different systems. So, I have experience with that. Damn, what's your family live under a bridge in a box? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, <no. laughs> um, but hey, I got cool toys. Um, you, you just, you just listen. Two Cerax, two Omnicans, a Plan Mecca. What? Uh, the comb beam, Plan Mecca. C- comb. CBCT. Yeah, the mid. Yeah. And then what else? Uh, the the Trio scanner, and I, the two Iteros. You got those? Yeah. A lot, but two two Iteros, the Trio scanner, um, the Trios. That's from. Um, um, Copenhagen. What's like a three shape? Three shape. 
one Plan Mecca CBCT, two Omnican, two Sarax. Holy crap, that's a million bucks. Yeah, I, I try not to count that. <laughs> wow, you are, you might be the most tech savvy son of a gun, period. <laughs> but but you must not have buyer's remorse because you went back and doubled down and have two of almost everything. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we got, we have the need for it. We use them. So, you know, I would say if you're just getting into the digital systems, finding one system with, and I, get, I think what you say is accurate, having a closed system. If you don't really get this stuff, you need to have your hand held the whole step of the way. Usually those closed systems have better support and easier workflow, but they limit you a little bit. Um, but that might be okay for you. Uh, in our practice, you know, we have our own lab that we work with. So having the ability to have open systems and use different things for us is really a necessity. So what, what lab you, you have your own lab or you we have our own lab on your dental office premise? Uh, it's about, uh, 10 miles away. From us. Wow. So me. how big is your, how many operatories and doctors are in your practice? So we have, um, we now have three practices, um, and it's my partner and I, and then we have uh, five associate dentists uh, that work within these three practices. So three practices with two partners and five associates. Right. And, and one lab. One lab. Holy moly, you're tearing it up. Um, we're doing good. <laughs> it's been good. And and, and I, I would imagine that three practices, um, you know, I... I I think a solo practicing dentist is getting crushed because they have so many hats to wear. I right. mean, when you, but when I go into these, um, when, I, I don't like the term corporate. I like big box because there's a difference between the, 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 fifth, the 35 corporate chains that have 50 or more locations like mm -hmm. Harlan and Pacific. That's huge. But when I go into even very small markets like Sioux Falls, you know, the, 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 the group that goes from a solo to just a north, west, east, and south, you know, four locations. It just gives them enough scale so they can have one full-time person in HR, marketing, right. supplies, accounting, bookkeeping, a CPA. Oh. You know, these poor dentists, you know, you got to learn how to do the dentistry, and you got to have the website, and you have to have the HR. It's just too many hats. Yeah. Well, I mean, the reality of it is to keep your overhead down, this, this really, you know, it's, it's a huge capital investment. There's a lot more risk involved. But at the end of the day, the numbers work better because just like you said, you can have dedicated people to dedicated uh, you know, needs and really help keep overhead costs down. So what, So will you give us your uh, benchmark overhead goals? Uh, should be uh, uh, rent, mortgage, equipment, all that stuff? Labor? 55. Yeah, we try to be around 55. 55% overhead? Yeah. Before you pay your uh, dentist? Uh, including them, not the partners, but the associates. So not the two partners, but the 55% total overhead would include the five associate dentist. Yeah. That that's the lowest overhead I've heard of that. Um, after paying associate dentist. Yeah, that's our, that's where we try to be. Holy gamola. That is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> and, what, and what, what's your secret to that? Um, is that, is that because, um, I mean, if, if all your costs are a dollar and you mm -hmm. do a dollar production, you have a hundred percent overhead. If all your costs are a dollar and you do $2, your overhead just went to 50%. Do you right. think your overhead is so low 55% because the two partners are producing such huge amounts of, uh, dentistry? That's, that's the main factor. Yeah. So it's, you know, and I always get asked that, how do you keep overhead down? I mean, you can't be a miser with most things. I mean, there's overheads, overhead, but like you said, you increase production and there goes your percentage. Yeah, and that's why the associate model, um, I, I, I just still don't see any evidence of it really working because like when you go, when you're lecturing at a seminar, the owner doctors taking notes in the front room and the associates like on their Facebook, posting <laughs> on Facebook doesn't come back after lunch when you go into an owner operator and the dentist is married and has four kids at home he does the second molar the associate right. refers it to an endodontist uh, when right. you when you're an owner and you got four kids at home you work that um that uh, molar endo in over your lunch break and if it's yeah. five o'clock and it's time to go home you'll stay there at six but you go on dental town the millennials are posting threads like well what do you do when there's a tooth that comes in at 4 30 and you close at five how do you how do you temporize that? And I'm like, 
Maybe you should just do your damn job. Maybe you should just do the damn root canal and crown and get home an hour late. But they're single. They're millennial. They, they just don't have that. Uh, when, when, when you don't have skin in the game, I'm not seeing the evidence. Then you go uh, to associates in private and corporate. Their turnover, I mean, it's considered awesome if they stay two years. Right. So, so do you see a lot of uh, associate turnover in your California market? So yes. However, and we've been pretty lucky. So our um, our first associate is going on six years now, um, and then the other associate that's in our main office is she's going on pushing three years, and then the other two associates are, um, were owners of the practices that we purchased. And then one of the other associates was in one of those practices that we purchased. She's been there for two years. And so part of it is, you know, we, we compensate them well. We, you know, help, help them feel like they're part of the game. But at the end of the day, like you said, I mean, we do, my partner and I do a lot of training with our other doctors and really try to have CE within our group. And yeah, I mean, you know, they kind of show up and do their thing. And sometimes it gets implemented and sometimes it doesn't. But um, I think they understand that we're invested in them and, and their success and we want them to be successful. So I think that carries a lot of weight and why they stay around and are part of our group. Well, I mean, every PhD economist, uh, at the university of Chicago, which has the most Nobel prize winning economists will tell you that incentives really matter. Oh, and, you- um, having an ownership, I mean, hell, that's the difference in the United States and communist Russia that, that, you know, that, that everybody lived through. I mean, when everybody's an employee, uh, in Russia, everyone shows up drunk and their productivity is pretty low. And then in America, where everybody owned their own farm, I mean, I mean, uh, their productivity was, uh, you know, so much greater. So it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting to see how people will build uh, corporate dental chains where every single dentist is an employee. That is an entirely different beast than, right. uh, than competing against dental offices where the dental offices are an owner. Yeah. And, and I, I think the final business model has not been found. Um, no, you know? I agree. And I, I think the lawyers are ahead of us because they they have these deals with partner. You know, you make you make partner. Yeah. Uh, no, and, that, and that's really the model that we're going to get to. I mean, at the end of the day, Howard, people are like, hey, what, what's in it for me? Right. right. Am I fattening your paycheck or mine? And so it, it really is helping people say, hey. This is in your best interest to do that second molar endo or to work through your lunch because you're getting compensated for it. You're doing the right thing for the patient, the right thing for the practice, and you get compensated. I mean, that's the only way it's going to work. Okay, so what? So walk through. Um, so so when you expanded two more locations, you didn't do a de novo startup. You bought a practice. Yes. So why why did you want to go from one location to three, and why did you do? Acquis- mergers and acquisitions, which is what Wall Street uses all day long, instead of a de novo build from scratch. What? What? How did that unfold? Um, part of it. Well, well, we'll start with the first question first. So the reason behind it, one is we were run out of space in our main location, and um, how big it, was that? How many? How many ops was that? Uh, six ops, and so you can imagine four doctors, two full time hygienists. It gets tight. We were already on split shifts, you know. A morning shift, afternoon shift kind of deal, and Friday, Saturday, all that kind of stuff. But anyways, we're out of room. So that was part of it. And, and the reality of it is, just looking at the numbers, you can go do a startup uh, and you know start building a practice from scratch, and it's going to take you a while to get into the black with that kind of scenario. That may be okay for you. For us, it was a numbers game. So we buy these other practices. Uh, the production off those doctors that stayed pays the bills. So no matter what, it's at least break even. Now we've been able to structure things and again, assume other costs and get overhead down. So they become somewhat profitable. It just depends on what extent, but it just made total sense just from a number of standpoints. So the doctors that sold you those two practices stayed on. Yeah, they stayed on. So why did, why did they want to sell then? Um, both of them were looking to change their schedule. So they wanted to get to, um, you know, working less days, which was great for us because we wanted their space. Um, they wanted to cash out while their practice was at the best value it was because they were working full time. Um, and it was interesting how it came down. Actually, we were initially just looking at one practice in particular. And then this other doctor got wind of what we were doing. He's like, well, I want in. He's like, I, I want he was actually in contract with another. Uh, so are multi- you are you technically a baby boomer? Uh, I'm are a you- gen. 
I think I'm Gen X. Gen X. Um, so I'm a boomer. You're at the tail end of Gen X. Um, yeah. Do you, you know, when you look at the uh, 35 corporate locations that have 50 or more offices, they're two thirds female dentist. Yeah. Do you think the millennial um, and especially the women are more likely to say, I don't want to be an owner operator like my dad and I would rather just be an employee? Or do, or, do you, or do you think that is a sexist I'm, generational no, wrong statement? I think it's a, I think it's a fantastic option. I think it's great. I mean, can, but you do know, you think I'm, it's real or do you think it's perceived? I think it's real. And it's based on my experience with what I've seen trying to find associates, et cetera. And, and I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily for our society, right? For dentistry, it creates a challenge. But for our society, I mean, I think it's a great thing. I'm kind of a traditionalist in my me, – Because the girls that graduated with me 30 years ago, I mean, Lisa Gonzalez, Stephanie Carmada, um, those girls, they, they, they were owner-operators to this day. And I would say the average girl in our class from 30 years ago had a bigger office – than the average guy. I mean, like Stephanie Carmont, I mean, huge. She's like you. She's placed all these implants. She had million dollar practice. So does Lisa Gonzalez. I mean, they were crushing. So the question is, I know the girls 30 years ago used to get really mad in class when these male dentists say, well, you know, a lot of these girls are going to get married and they're going to work part time. And, and if they marry, you know, blah, blah. And, and they would just fume. And they didn't do that. They yeah. did not do it. Now it's 30 years later. We can see what they did. They worked their ass off three years. So the question is, are the girls and guys graduating today, the, the millennials, are they different than the boomers from 30 years ago? I, I think so. But I will tell you this. I think just based on, again, on my experience the, and even going back from my female classmates, even if they drop to part time, a lot of them are doing as much dentistry part time as some of us are doing full time. You know what I mean? They, they are making it work. There's no question about it. Um, is it going to be the the norm? It's I don't know. It's tough to say, but I see more of that trend. But do you see a lot of uh, do you see a lot of the associates when they don't have skin on the game? Do you see them uh, a lot of turnover in the Bay Area? Yes, like I said, we've been fortunate, but in general, but in general, more, not not yeah. your location, but in general, what do you what do you see? Yeah, I'd say again that if they hit two years, that's pretty good, right? right. But I'll tell you again, in, interesting enough in Silicon Valley, Howard. So. You know, in tech companies here, if, a, if an employee stays at a tech company two years, that's almost too long, right? So it, the millennials are jumping around the tech companies here all the time. I see patients every six months. And it seems like they got a new job every time I see them. So that's just the norm of what happens in this society and that culture. Interesting. Yeah, because, you know, they said the same thing in Japan where uh, their, their birth rate is now down to under one. It's down to 09 where the 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 ba their baby boomer generation, you got a job at Toyota when you were twenty five, you retired there at sixty five. I mean, all their parents uh, worked for GM, Ford, Toyota, Honda. They were all lifers, and that is just that that whole concept is gone, isn't it? Gone, gone. Yeah, yeah. and you know another thing. Um, I've had this point out to me. Um, I was lecturing in uh, Sydney and Melbourne last week, and we and we uh, podcast interviewed. Uh, there's only two publicly traded corporate dental offices on the ASX and there's one in Singapore and I had the the biggest uh whale in that in that market and he was saying that um the millennials are completely different he said the baby boomers I mean look at the 10 commandments what, what are the first three commandments um obey a god keep the sabbath holy don't take his name in vain what was the fourth one again obey your parents you know right. the first four out of 10 are obey someone else and he said the millennials um, he said, our generation, you were the doctor, you did what they said. You know, if you said, I need a root canal and crown, they just say, well, Dr. Field, you're the doctor, you know best. And the millennial says, I am most loyal to me. And he says, you look at these corporate dental offices where they were saying his, his publicly traded corporate chain has 20% turnover of dentists per year while they just keep growing by millions and millions and millions. He says, look, this is evidence. The millennials don't care. They say, this is my office. It's convenient for me. It's got convenient hours. I assume a filling is a filling is a filling. A cleaning is a cleaning is a cleaning. I don't really care who does it or who fills my prescription of penicillin. They're loyal to themselves first. And he says, as everybody badmouths his 20% uh, burn and churn of dentists per year, he's, he's got a $100 million valuation on the ASX, and he owns 80% of the stock. He says, I, I, don't, I don't care what you say. They're right. loyal to themselves 
they're not loyal uh, to the company. So, th- so you say these people that work at a tech stock, um, they're you know they they jump every two years. They're not loyal to Facebook or Google or LinkedIn or Twitter. They're loyal to themselves. Yeah, does it is it close to their house? What are the stock options? You know, can they come in late? You know, all what's the what's the cafeteria food like? You know, that's <laughs> kind of what matters. Yeah. So my gosh. So so let's so well, let's walk through these uh, technology purposes. You like Cirac? You have yeah. Two of them. Two of them. Two of them in three locations. No, uh, actually, that's a good question. So we have two in our first location and one in, in one of the other locations. So three total. My God, three Cirac. So wh- why do you like Cirac? And, and why not E4D by Plan Mecca? Uh, we've been doing Cirac a long time. When E4D came out, I mean, they just didn't have the same, you know, they hadn't gone through the same bumps in the road that Cirac had gone through. I think they're better now. And it, having, again, it be open source is nice. But the Cirrus workflow, like you said, with a closed system, it just works. You know, it's it's very predictable. It works really well for us. Um, and I think it's going to be a game changer um, in 15 days when they lose their exclusive with uh, Patterson and yeah. start selling them through Henry Schein and and others. Uh, do, you, do you think that's going? What, what do you think that's going to do for you as a Cirrus user by not having it exclusive with Patterson? I'm hoping costs come down. I mean, it's right it's, competition. Yeah, that's the big thing. They're they're pretty expensive but you know as far as the system itself the results we get for it no issue no issue whatsoever our associates crank on them um you know they they work very well and our patients love them it's funny even last week i don't do a ton of now i'm doing mostly implant surgery and design type stuff but i had one last week i was doing and i told the patient you know i don't i don't really have time to to do a seric today i'll just do a quick lab crown you come back to the temporary and he said, "Oh no, I'll wait then till you have time to do it in one visit. I'm not coming back." And so, and who who uh, does who does the scan and milling and all that? Is that all? The, is that your doctors or are the assistants doing that? We we do it. Um, and so I, I know there's different modalities, but I'm a big fan of hey, I think we should be doing it. It gives us an opportunity to talk to the patient while we're going through the design process. We can show them what we're doing, why we're doing it. I just think that's a service that should be provided. It takes, you know, what, three minutes. It's very quick. Um, I have no problem with that. I mean, there are, are offices that turn and burn and they say, hey, you prep and you get out and you let your assistant do the rest. And that works for them. Um, with our patient base, that wouldn't fly. Hmm. And and um, when you say your patient base, uh, um, do you think um, um, hours available, your hours are a competitive advantage? I mean, do, do, do you think no. most of the San Francisco Valley is most dentists are Monday through Friday, eight to five? And do you do extended hours? Do you think that's a big part of your secret sauce or not really? No, because that's, that's done. That's done all over the place around here. So that's what's, not what's a, done all over the place. The extended hours and, you know, having more availability. That's there. There aren't so many of the Friday off guys anymore. Well, even what, if, what are your hours? Uh, we're, we're Monday through Friday, seven to six. And then uh, one Saturday a month, eight to five. So one Saturday, eight to five, Monday through Friday, seven a.m. to six p.m. Yeah. And you're still and you're still getting those people on the Friday afternoons. That that was where we science kind of fell apart. Yeah, on and Fridays. We, we were worried about that too, but it it hasn't happened. And even the Saturday thing, we're like, well, we'll throw it out there. You know, people. No, I was talking about my employees. By two o'clock, they're they're oh, all okay. at the bar. <laughs> That's another story. And the patients no, are sitting there alone in the operatory. Our, our team's been great about it. That hasn't been an issue. Interesting. And uh, then you got the Plan Mecca CBCT. Which one was that? Uh, it's the 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 mid one. So the one that gets you know not the full head, but the you know the, what we need to see with the oral structures. So so why did you get that? Because you also had two iteros. Right. So the so, two itero scanners or CBCTs? Scanners, uh, inoral scanners. So they're you know analogous to the Seric and also the the trios. Um, so the Seric was first, then the plan Mecca came. Uh, and why, and then, why did you get the plan Mecca instead of a uh, dense place Serona's Galileo's? Uh, plan Mecca was a little nicer is, at that point. And then also the plan Mecca had the extra bite wing uh, function, which the other one didn't, uh, which comes in handy for gagging patients, etc. So it was, it was a nice, nice unit. Have you ever been to their headquarters in Helsinki, Finland? No, I'd like to go. Sounds that nice. was uh, that. That's an interesting place because um, uh, those you know you, you bought Trios, which is a three shape out of Copenhagen, Denmark, 
Right. And my my here's my belief on those great companies. When you go to Scandinavian, like Three Shape and Copenhagen, been there. Um, um, Plan Mecca, Helsinki, Finland, their winners are so brutal that the only way you get through them is everybody just works. 12 hour days. I mean, like seven to seven, six days a week. Then Sunday, they just go home and do their laundry and all that stuff. And then when it finally summer breaks out um, and then you go there, everybody has taken off like, like a month and they're all on the Mediterranean and they're all laying out <laughs> in the park. So when you go um, to those uh, like um, Helsinki or Copenhagen in the great tourist time, none of the restaurants are open. I mean, you walk down the street, four out of five restaurants are closed. Uh, yeah. Everyone's gone. They're all laying out in the park. And I think the reason they're such great um, civilizations and great technology is because during those long, brutal winters, the, the, I've had so many dentists tell me, look, you got two options. Either you're going to crawl up in your house with 100 gallons of vodka and just stay drunk all winter, <laughs> or, or you're going to work. work your brains out. Right. And, and he said, there's nothing else to do but work. And I used to th- believe that with Creighton because – at Creighton, so many times in Omaha, Nebraska, you know, I, my mind, I wanted to just play on Saturday and we'd look out the window and it was like 10 degrees below zero and it's sleeting on the window and it's gray overcast. And I just thought, hell, we might as well just stay in and study. Whereas right. then when I went to ASU for my MBA and you see this amazing weather and everybody's skateboarding and I thought, man, every college in America should be moved to the Arctic Circle. So those kids, uh, <laughs> But anyway, it's a interesting place. But you like the Plan Mecca CBCT? I do. Yeah, I, and I look the Galileos. They have, an, or you know, Serona has a new one. We actually need to get one in our, one of our new offices. And I've been looking at that system. It, it's nice. It's nice. So Which I, one? I don't know what I would get. The um, not the Galileos, but they have a step down from the Galileos now. I forget the name of it. Okay. So yeah. so so what's the difference in the scanners? You you got a uh, Copenhagen Denmark three shaped trios. You got two Iteros. What's the pros and cons if someone's listening to you and say, if you had to buy one, which one would you buy? So the one that has the nicest interface is the Itero, uh, for sure. Uh, the easiest scanner to use is meaning, you know, how quickly it scans and the quality is going to be the, the Trios. The reason we got the Itero was for mostly for Invisalign. Uh, that was the initial reason for getting it. We do a lot of Invisalign. Because they data. bought. Because they bought, bought Itero. And originally, that and was the only. Invisalign's right by you. Yeah, they are. They're in San Jose, just down the road. Yeah. Do you do you know the CEO? He's a patient of mine. <laughs> no way. What's his name? Joe. Joe. Joe Hogan. Joe Hogan. I have been my my biggest fantasy is to get that guy on a podcast. All right. I'll I, I don't him. have any. I, you you can't get his contact information on the internet. I mean, he's it's. No, it's, he lives. Uh, he lives probably a mile away from me. He's a patient of mine, so I'll put in good word. Will, will you will you will yeah. you email him and CC me and say I'm yeah. begging? Oh, shit, I'd fly to San Fran to do it. He's a great guy. And the, yeah, I've seen him on um, I've seen him on um, um, what what is that show? It was MSNBC? What what's that other bald guy? He kind of looks like me. That um, that crazy bald stock guy on TV. Uh, yeah, the Mad Money guy. Yeah, Mad Money. Yeah, he's been on Mad Money. Say, hey, this is this is the what's that Mad Money guy's name? Jim Cramer. Tell him Jim. that Howard Ferran is the Jim Cramer of dentistry. And Jim, okay. you say he's already dealt with the craziest bald guy, Jim Cramer, on Mad Money. Um, because <laughs> The reason I want to talk to him is because, you know, when I got out of school in 87, all the big brands, Colgate, uh, Crest, Listerine, they were all made already. The yeah. only consumer brand that I can think of in the last 30 years, from Kansas to Kathmandu, I've lectured in Malaysia, Cambodia. You go to a restaurant in Cambodia and tell the waitress you're a dentist, she'll ask you about Invisalign. Yeah. I mean, it is absolutely around the world. I think it's the biggest. And how they built that brand was just amazing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so I, I'd love to talk to that dog. Um, but anyway, um, so so let's switch. Invis- and the reason implants and Invisalign yeah. are so huge it's because when you go to so many of these government dental insurance schemes in uh, Tokyo, Paris, London, where the government only gives you $100 for a molar root canal and your costs are going to be 300 if you do it right or $400, um, the reason Invisalign implants are taken off because that's the only two procedures where insurance or government doesn't set the fee. Right. So when you go to Tokyo, Paris, and London, 
where the NIS, the NIH will only give you $100 for a molar root canal. Well, what do you think the dentists are doing? Do you think they're going to do a molar root canal for $100 US? No. What do you think they're going to do? Extract an implant. <laughs> I know. And, and you just would think, well, a doctor would never do that. And I'm like, well, incentives matter because they won't tell you that on a podcast, but they'll sure as hell tell you after the podcast or we're not taping now, are we? And so oh. they're... Uh, and that's another thing. Um, I've seen a lot of these uh, big welfare, Medicaid, Medicare clinics in Asia and, and Europe, and they say, well, you know, we lose money on all the cleanings, exams, x-rays, and fillings, but we pull out an Invisalign case at least one a week. And we're mm. doing 50 to 70 Invisalines a year, and the uh, same with an implant. And so that's what puts them in the profit zone and the reason they have a nice lifestyle is because they're almost using it as a bait and switch where okay i'll lose money on all the cleaning exams and x-rays but hopefully i'll upgrade uh one person to invisalign and one person to an implant per week and now i'm uh, profitable i'm in the profit zone yeah no i mean it's 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 a great model it's a great service for patients and then other interesting thing with invisalign in particular their technology that they use you know, general dentists who have we get very little ortho training in dental school, if any, uh, are able to do these orthodontic cases because it's it's helping us. It's setting these cases up for us. And uh, I do some lecturing for Invisalign. Uh, the doctors I work with, you know, have a lot of fun with it. They really enjoy it. Yeah, that is uh, that is interesting. So, what would you say? But okay, but I'm going to play devil's advocate. You, you're talking to six. You know, when um, I always tell my guests. Send me an email, Howard at Dentaltown.com, and tell me if you're how old you are, if you like the show, who you'd like to hear. But I'm amazed at how many emails come in and they're D2s, they're D3s. Yep. I mean, it's amazing. It's at least 20, 25%. They're not even dentists yet. They're all gonna get out of school and say, but Joe, we didn't do we didn't place one implant in all of school and we didn't do one Invisalign. How do you get out of dental school and you've never placed one implant? And you've never done one Invisalign case. How do you go from zero to one? Great question. Uh, let's talk about the Invisalign first. And uh, first of all, I was one of those D2s, D3s back in the day, jumping on Dental Town and trying to figure out what was going on with my classes. So uh, it's a great resource for dental students. So you were, you were in Dental Town in uh, dental school? I was, yeah, for sure. Um, it was awesome. And I would use it, you know, every time I had questions from the clinic, hey, what's going on here? What's this material? What's this cement? I jump on Dental Town, search it, read the forums, and learn a ton. So yeah, they should be doing that. I'm glad I, they are. I still think it's Star Wars crap. I mean, I'm. I mean, I cannot believe that on your iPhone there's a quarter million dentists in your pocket if you have yeah. the Dental Town app. And with that search bar, uh, say you had a question on say Bruxer. I mean, you could just search Bruxer and pull up a gazillion posts on Bruxer or anything instantly. Right. I mean, it's pretty yeah. damn cool. It's awesome. And it's, you, you know, you gotta, it's the danger of it. You gotta filter a little bit of noise, right? And so some of the dental students, I think, hopefully are smart enough to say, hey, this guy's a knucklehead or this guy knows what he's talking about. So that's the thing to decipher through. But uh, with that being said, I'll talk about Invisalign real quick. So when I was in dental school, I actually met with the head of the ortho department to try to inst institute some Invisalign training at our school. And at UCLA, USC, watch USC your mouth. Trojan. <laughs> just kidding yeah so you're uh, a usc trojan i am yep and ucla and so, that's not even uh that's those are the bears yeah bruin bruin, bruin bruin and that's a bear right who knows we don't talk about them okay. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. no so you know the essentially the the head of the ortho department said look you know the message i got was dental students are too stupid to be learning invisalign you just need to focus on learning how to do a filling in the crown Okay, that yeah, was it. That's what they told so us. My, my first CE course out of dental school was the Invisalign certification course. So I went and took the course, learned the nuts and bolts of what's involved, and off I went. Uh, I, I always recommend find a mentor. Um, a lot of the smart orthodontists in the area mentor GPs, and they say, hey, look, there's this is how you do it. I help you with these cases. Great. If you have cases that you don't want to do that are a little beyond what your comfort level is, I'm happy to help you out. I'll do those cases, et cetera. It's a great symbiotic relationship. Yeah, because they think in, in abundance, not fear. Exactly. They're smart. And so that's, you know, the I, most of the younger orthodontists, my experience, they're smart about it and they'll mentor and, and help out. And that's what I did. I got a great mentor and he would help me out on cases and ones that 
would either take too long or were too hard for me to know how to do, I'd send to him and he was happy. I was happy. And he's, you know, he's got four kids too. He's got to put food on the table. So, you know, you got to take care of each other. So that, that's my recommendation with Invisalign. And then, you know, the courses that, that are out there, their uh, Invisalign Institute that's on their website, their courses are amazing. You know, what you're able to learn about orthodontics, how Invisalign works specifically. If you don't understand it, it's your own fault. The resources are there at your feet. So I think it's a very straightforward thing. Implants are a little bit of a different ball game. Uh, I think it's, in, it's hard to get in trouble with Invisalign. I think it's really easy to get in trouble with implants. And so, you know, getting, again, CE courses, I did the maxi course through the AID, which is 300 hours of continuing education on implant-specific uh, dentistry. I really think you got to get going on that. And then the uh, same kind of principle holds true, having a mentor to help walk you through your first cases. I did my first implants. I placed four implants on my dad with a buddy of mine basically holding my hand, getting through it. And that was after Howard I'd done about 100 hours of CE already on implants and hands-on courses, et cetera. The so, best research primates are always family. Right? Yeah, because, right. you know, if something goes wrong, whatever. You get what you pay for. <laughs> <laughs> so, But, they're, hey, they're still in his mouth 10 years later, so they're doing good. Um, but, you know, I, I think the resources are out there, resources like Dental Town. We have mentors. We have guys that are wanting to help younger dentists. Uh, you know, thinking, hey, when the tide comes in, all the ships rise. It's not looking at it as you're stealing, you know, bread off my table. It's, it's just having that. It's better for everybody, the better we all are. So how is San Francisco? You have two dental schools. How big are the class sizes of UAP and University of California, San Francisco, UCSF? How many so are they you, dumping into the city each year? UOP, I think, is in around the mid-100, something like 150, somewhere in that range. Uh, UCSF, I want to say, is around 60 to 80. They're smaller. Class okay, size. that's the same as my backyard. We got Midwestern and Glendale dumping 150, and we got AT still in Mesa dumping 80. Um, right. do, do you think that, uh, you know, economics in three words, supply and demand, do you think that makes it hard to practice in the Bay Area when you got two schools that are dumping 225? Uh, I mean, they dump 1,000 every four years. I mean, do you think... Yeah. That is uh, a balance to the offering liquidity to the olding guy, older guys retiring and selling their practices, or do you think it makes it for a very hard place to um, practice? You know, it's. It, I think it kind of depends on the on the practice model. So I think insurance driven practices that really rely on these insurance plans, etc. Um, it's it's a hard model to to compete with, and so a lot of the younger dentists are getting into those models, and they're just. They're fighting for scraps, so to speak. But and, and you say you're not insurance driven, not that you don't take the insurances, but that you're so uh, concentrated in implants and Invisalign, which aren't insurance set prices. Right. Yeah. So you know we're not necessarily having to succumb to the uh, evil empire, so to speak. I mean, do you take all the PPOs. I mean, I mean, Delta Delta is a PPO because they set the fees and right. they claim they have. 96% of American dentists participating. I mean, they tell that to everyone they're selling insurance to. So do you take Delta? Uh, on two of our practices, our fee-for-service, the third one is a Delta PPO practice. So two of them you don't take Delta. Right. And one of them you do. Yeah. Wow. And how and which... Uh, what, and I'll what, tell what, you, the, the third one is we're, we're going to go to fee-for-service as soon as we can on that practice. And when you drop being a Delta provider, uh, what happens to uh, all the Delta patients? Uh, about a third of them leave, two thirds stay. That's what wow. we found. And so, um, wow, talk more about that. I mean, that. You, so what you just said is everyone's fantasy, but nobody has, not many people have the testicular fortitude uh, to do it. But you're saying... It's worked for you to do it, and you'll lose a third and keep two thirds. Right, and I'll, I'll, I'll credit where credits due. My partner is the one that had the, for, the testicular fortitude to do that. Um, it, it's it's one of those things where you, you just get to the point where you're like, look, I want to I want to work smarter, not harder. You know, I want to do what's right. I want to do what I enjoy doing, what's best for my patients, and I don't want to have uh, an insurance company telling me how I'm supposed to do my job and what I should be doing. For my patients, I mean, I, there are just so many ethical issues with insurances and how these practices are run. 
So you just, just so you done. don't take any PPOs in two of your practices. Right. So we're fee for service. We bill insurance for patients and they get reimbursed by their insurance according to their insurance plan, but we're we are fee for service. Well, you know, I you know the best thing about lecturing around the world is you see this rodeo being played or not played at various levels of the game like okay, so there's seven and a half billion people. There's only dental insurance covering a billion people. You know, right. there's no dental insurance in China, India, and Russia. They don't even get it. But I watched this rodeo in the NHS when I got out of school 30 years ago. All the 20,000 dentists in England were the NHS, and they and they just kept lowering the fees, lowering the fees, increasing the volume, and dentists had to go bankrupt before they dropped the plan. And they'd say, right. "Okay, well, I went bankrupt, so I think I'm just going to open up." And even if I just have one pay, and what I'm seeing is this, this is very bizarre. The insurance model from the sixties and the seventies was this big practice where you delegate all this stuff to the assistants and the hygienists and all these admin people. And then after they're driven into the ground, they just open up a dental office. It was like one chair with like one employee and their phone is their own iPhone. And they just see one person an hour and they're taking home $150,000, $180,000 a year. And they just say, dentistry is not a game of volume. And right. they used to have nine employees and six ops and running around with a chicken with their head cut off until they went bankrupt. And now you right. go back to England, and now there's about 5,000 of the 20,000 dentists that don't participate with any of that NHS stuff. Yeah, it's a racket. I mean, let's, I mean, just the reality of it is insurance companies are in business of making money, and they don't want your patients to get money. They don't want you to get money. They want the money. Uh, it's a total racket. And most of our patients understand it, and they get how it works. And so we, we have, honestly, our very little pushback from our patients on that. Now, of course, they're, I, I know what my homies are thinking. They're all These boys are listening to you from Louisiana and Mississippi <laughs> and Oklahoma saying, Okay, Howdy, okay, Joseph, are you in uh, a really rich Silicon Valley where all your patients have stock options for eBay and Uber? I mean, or would you say you're in really rich areas that you're not finding in rural Oklahoma? So two of our practices are. One of them is, is not as an affluent area, right? Um, but I, I honestly, the it's no different here because – Incomes are higher, but cost of living is exponentially higher. So the term we use here is house poor, right? So house someone might poor. be making two hundred thousand dollars a year, but you know they're barely paying their bills because their house costs two and a half million dollars, right? Oh my God, I know. I'll it's, never it's, forget. I was in I was in Manhattan in this very famous tennis. Maybe I shouldn't say his name. And uh, okay, Larry Rosenthal. And he wanted to show <laughs> me his uh, his apartment. His, this was like thirty years ago, and he just bought it. I think. I think it was it was back in the uh, late '80s, or maybe it was like 1990. He just bought it for like eight million dollars or something, and uh, it was like a thousand square feet. Right. And I'm like, you paid eight million dollars for a thousand square feet, and he's like, oh, you can see Central Park. And I'm like, in Kansas, <laughs> you couldn't spend eight million dollars on a house. You could buy a <laughs> subdivision for eight million dollars. Right. And kick out the whole the whole uh, cul-de-sac. I mean, it was just a so yeah, those houses in San Fran. What, what what are those houses that I always love when you're uh, you're looking at the bay and you're walking down those hills? There's all these little houses and they can see the Golden Gate Bridge. What what are those houses running for? So that's four to six million, depending on you know what it, what it has. But if it's- you ever have a patient come in, she's like an eighty year old widow and she owns one of those houses and <laughs> she's single and lonely. Could you uh, could you fix her up with me? <laughs> I will. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, give give her my email. Keep tabs um, on. But um, yeah, that so so you're so you're making bank, but your house poor, right? And so you know the it's the same problem as universal. Now, granted, there are demographics in different parts of the country where it's, this may not fly. I, I get that, and I I'm first to say yeah, that that's probably true. But once patients are educated, and even if you lower your fees to where they're comfortable, you set up your own insurance plans. I mean, there are so many different models to get away from this big insurance driven uh, dentistry that really benefits the patient and the practitioner. I think people just have to be a little more brave about it. So uh, you promised me an hour of your life. I can't believe we went over an hour. Can I hold you just another overtime, just a tad? Oh, I got plenty of time. I'm done for the day. You're, it's just you, man. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Okay, she's 25 years old. She didn't place one implant in school. She's, she, they're, they're all listening to this on their commute to work. She's commuting to work. She's working for corporate. How does she go from zero to one implant. What would what and 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 I got it I got it with one caveat. 
in this country, America, so much of the implant uh, education is tied to a manufacturer. And right. she's telling me in emails on Dental Town that she almost feels like she has to pick an implant because all the training is tied to a system. So she's kind of got paralysis by analysis because she doesn't want to start learning this system and she doesn't know if it's the right system. So what, what would you tell her in a peanut butter and jelly world where most of the education is tied to a system and right. how, do, how do you disintermediate the knowledge from the system? I mean, some people say, hey, you're not driving the car that you drove during driver's ed, so it doesn't matter. But what would you, what would you tell her? Yeah, well, I mean, briefly on the systems, Howard, I've placed probably 15, 16 different implant systems. They all have pluses and minuses. None of them are really bad. Um, my recommendation for these new docs is, A, find a mentor. Surgeon, GP, someone that's doing a lot of implants that's willing to mentor you. Use the system that they're using, use the company they're using, and jump on board with some of their CE. So companies, uh, manufacturers, some of the big name implant companies, they invest a lot of money in their continued education. They see it as a benefit for them too because, like you said, it's getting doctors on board in their system. But the, the education is quality. I love it. And so that, that's number one. Number two is get involved in an organization like the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. That's very, I believe, non-biased. Go to their conferences, you know, take their CE courses. So you like the AAID? I do. I think they're fan. They're the most GP because again, I'm ICUI, uh, AO, all those. The AID, I think, is the most GP friendly of the organizations. And what I mean by that is they're not looking down at you because you're a GP doing implants. So AAID is the most general uh, dentist friendly, like AGD. Yeah, in my, in my and you're opinion. saying ICOI is more specialist centered, like the American Dental Association. ICOI and AO, American Academy of Osseo Integration. American uh, Academy of Osseo Integration, AO, Academy of Osseo Integration. Academy, and that's also specialist driven. Yeah, and don't get me, I love their conferences, their courses, they're fantastic. But for a new dentist, I think AID is the way to start. The AID, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, uh, the bottom line is. You go into the American Dental Association, I mean, um, what percent of all those uh, um, committees are filled with, with the people that are specialists? Yeah. And the AGD is all general dentists. So you're saying the AGD and the AAID are for the general dentist, and the ICOI and the AO is more specialist driven. Generally speaking, yeah. And going back to the history, because there's a lot of roots in history, a lot of this stuff you don't understand unless you understand the history and uh, of a country or whatever, and... When Brandmark came to America, when he first came here, he would only teach it to oral surgeons. Right. And it took a decade of begging to let the periodontists come involved. Right. And so now the uh, young bastard child is the general yeah. dentist. And now we're like, hey, can we come to this party too? And, well, and, uh, and we should be the ones driving this, this ship, man. I mean, we're the ones restoring. We're the ones that are responsible for the end product. You know, if we're not placing the implant, we should be telling them how it should be placed. It's, that's BS. Okay, but she's, she's listening to you right now, and she's going bullshit. She's, Come on, you've, you've used 15 systems. You say they all have plus or minuses, but what if you only had to buy one today? Ooh. Um, again, I would stick with my mentor, right? Um, all right what they're placing because they're going to be the ones holding your hand and they have all the bits and pieces. And if man, the case you're doing the case and crap, that implants the wrong size. I need another one. You call your mentor. Hey, do you have this inventory? And they got, a I more agree, control. man, that's, it's everything because when you fly across the country to go learn implants, that guy lecturing on the other side of America, isn't going to be there when you screw up. And right. why don't you just walk across the street and press the flesh. And we knock on the door to your periodontist oral surgeon, and he says, hey, you want to place implants? Go to perio school. Go to oral surgery school. Yeah. Then great. I'm glad you met him. He thinks in fear and scarcity. You can cross his name off the list, and hopefully you'll never run into him again the rest of your life. And then you go yeah. to the next door, and they say, come on in. And right. that's the lowest price, lowest cost. Now you got a friend. You got a buddy. So when you're in the middle of a surgery, and you call it, you know how many times when in the 80s I had to call up my buddies and say, can I send the patient over to you right now? Right. I pulled out the crown, but I'm having a hard problem getting the roots out. And yeah. your buddy helped you out. I'd rather have that buddy across the street than some fancy instructor um, in another state. 
Hundred percent, and that's what I had when I started out. I'd parried on us, took me under his wing, helped me out. I'd, if I got in trouble, I'd send the case. He'd bail me out, and now I'm I'm paying it forward. I'm doing the same thing for other docs, and they call me. It's I'm about to leave for the day. Like Joe, this implant went in the sinus. Can you help me out? Send him over. I got you. I mean, that's it's just it's it's a nice thing to have, and so that's where you want to start. Oh yeah, yeah, that, yeah, and plus, plus it's just so much more of a rewarding career. When you have buddies in your yeah. profession. In fact, here's my advice for everybody listening right now. You know, you know what you need to do? You need to go to breakfast, lunch, and dinner with more of your homies in your zip code. And I'm saying that's all you people spending time on Dentaltown. Why do you spend all day talking to dentists all around the world? And you and you're you know how many times I walked into a medical dental building and I said, How many dentists are in this building? They say eight. I'll say, When's the last time you had lunch or dinner or breakfast with all other seven? And they'll usually say <laughs> five. They never have in their whole life after a right. decade, and two of them. One was like two years ago, and one was four years ago. And dude, that's just that's just uh, your network. Your net worth is always equal to your network, and the Correct. people that are networking uh, with the dentists in their zip code and doing the most lunches and dinners and friends and all that, you're gonna have to get better, great information in your head, and that's gonna make you explode. Yeah. And it, 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 at the end of the day, it doesn't hurt you. It makes everybody better. It makes everybody better. The patient benefits. The practitioners benefit. It's the right thing to do. So last last question. Uh, she's been working at Aspen for four years. She so wants to break out and go on her own. But, you know, she's just walking around that swimming pool, sticking her toe in the deep end. And she's just afraid to walk jump. up on the high dive and jump. What would you tell her? Jump, make the jump, man. It's, you know, at the end of the day, the best way for job satisfaction, profitability, et cetera, you got to be an owner dentist. You really do. You do not want to work for someone else. So whether you get into a, a, a group practice, partnership scenario, uh, some of these models that have ownership potential, y- you want to have skin in the game. That That's where the reward comes from of being doing what we're doing. I mean, dentistry is hard, Howard. I mean, it's not easy work. It, there's a lot of stuff involved. And being an owner makes it worth it, in my opinion. And you're out there in the middle of Silicon Valley. Um, what would you say to an old guy like me who's – right now everybody thinks Facebook's all that in a bag of chips. But I remember when they used to say it about MySpace. I mean right. MySpace is all that. I mean, And I look at the data, and you look at the S&P 500 in 1950. By 2015, 88% of those companies were gone. There's only a 12% survival rate. From 1950 to 2015, Ryan, could you find the stat from 2000 uh, to 2017? What percent of the S and P 500? Because I read it's it's even been more brutal um, from 2000 to 2017. So my question is this: How are you feeding all those new patients? And you're in a high tech valley. I mean, is direct mail dead? Is the yellow pages dead? Is it all Facebook? Is it Google AdWords? Are those the 400 pound gorillas that feed your three? locations or what, what what's feeding three locations so it's uh, internet's number one so your internet presence um you know it, it comes from your patient reviews all that stuff that that is number one without question because you know even when we see in a referral setting hey my i see patients daily they say oh my my general dentist said i need an implant they were going to send me somewhere but I, I jumped online i found you it happens every day. So having that strong internet presence is number one. Wait, wait, say it again. So half the companies since since 1999 are gone. 2009 down 17%. And since 2011, 11% are gone. So, you know, it's so funny how these companies, they're so arrogant because they think since they're all that in a bag of chips that they can do anything. You know, like 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 when Facebook bought Instagram, I mean, you, you post a link to like a, a 5K for an oral cancer march. And they won't even let your link be activated because they, they don't want you to leave Instagram. They want to shove more sponsored ads down your throat. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like don't, don't be too cocky, buddy. There's a high mortality rate. Uh, I mean, 
Yahoo was the king of the hill early to you know early 2000s but now they're almost bankrupt right so. yeah and you and Google tried to sell to Yahoo what was it for like 1 billion in like 94 and, right. and no they, they they I think they offered him 1 billion and Sergey Brin and Larry Page countered at 5 billion and Yahoo said no way right. <laughs> and, now, and now Google's worth half a trillion uh, but yeah so um but um um the the last thing I want to say and this is so true and it's so brutal, but I have four kids. You have four kids. You were talking about some other guy that had four kids. Uh, who were you talking about? My orthodontist buddy. Yeah, your orthodontist buddy. When I see these kids for the last 30 years, and I predict who's going to make it. My dad used to always tell me growing up in Kansas, he said, you see four hungry coyotes walking down a dirt road, something's going to die. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, when I've been banking on these kids, those kids that had stay-home wives, and four kids, they were at work early, they worked through lunch, they stayed after, they crushed it. And you know who did the poorest? The kid whose dad paid for dental school, didn't get married, had no kids, and at 5 o'clock is wanting to hit the bars and have a little fancy drink with an umbrella in it. And they wouldn't want, they wouldn't go to online CE, or if they did go, if you did take them to the CE courses, they, they were on Facebook the whole time or disappeared at lunch. I'll tell you what, um, I, I give almost all of your credit. Uh, to the, your four kids, because that's what makes you so hungry and passionate and driven. Oh, I agree, hundred percent. And I, you know, I had my first kid right after Part One boards. Uh, my wife worked at the dental school when we were there, so we commuted in together. So I had to be at school early and stay late because she was working, right? So I'm studying when I'm not in class, and hundred percent that anchors you that motivates you and gets you. I to know work. they tell me these old guys. Some of they go, "What advice would you give an associate?" I say, "Just get." A hungry kid. Get one with a stay-home wife and four kids, and you own a slave. Right. (laughs) But you get someone who's got a cush job, no debt, no – if they're not hungry, they're kind of lazy. Right. So just get someone – get someone with 12 kids (laughs) that lives in a shoe – (laughs) <laughs> and you have someone that would work Sundays from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So that's my advice. Get incentivized. But, hey, Joe, thank you so much, uh, so much, seriously, for coming on the show today. You're a legend in my mind. You're a legend in many minds. And if you can deliver me that guy from Invisalign, I'll tell you what, I'll even give you all four of my kids. That's how much, how grateful I'd be. You'd go yeah. to eight kids overnight. Very nice. Ryan, well, hey, are you ready to move to San Fran? <laughs> Howard, thank you for what you do. You've been a great influence for me starting out early in my career, so I appreciate the efforts and the work that you do to help us. So thank you. Ah, thank you, buddy. I hope you have a rocking hot day and enjoy raising those four kids. Let me say, give you one thing on those four kids. I thought when my oldest, when they were sixteen, you know, they I had four boys in sixty months, and before the oldest one got a set of car keys, I thought my kids were so good, I should actually write a book on how to raise <laughs> kids because they were so perfect. And then one by one, you give them a set of car keys, and they'll get in more trouble with those set of car keys. So just enjoy the the perfect children at 10, 8, 3, and 3. And just well, and then come talk to me when they're all uh, between 16 and 22 and they all got cars. <laughs> I'll be as bald as you at that point, Howard. Yeah, Don't worry. Yeah. All right, buddy. Have a rocking hot day. All right. You too. Take care.